Hey, peace, love, and welcome to another episode of the DJP. So I've been going through some weird stuff in my life lately, really having to tackle some uncomfortable situations that have arisen. Nothing too terrible or anything, just just uncomfortable. And that can be just that, uncomfortable. But that's where we get our growth at, right? So I've just taken on these responsibilities and uh, these new aspects of life and changes that I'm undergoing as a project and an exercise in my resilience. And uh, it's going okay. It's only been a couple days so far. Well, not even that really. But it's going all right. Yeah. We'll see how it turns out. I'm sure I'll let you know. Um, on this episode of the DJP, my guest is Reverend Jeremy Sean Hall. And he's actually from Pensacola, Florida, which is insane because you hardly ever meet anybody that's from here. Even when you live here, you don't really meet too many people that are from here because most of the smart ones get out. (laughs) Um, Some of us stay. Some of us end up coming back, as is my case. I've left numerous times and always end up coming back. Uh, Anyway, he is a reverend. He was formerly a reverend in the Southern Baptist Church nomination. He has officially been excommunicated for his views of radical inclusivity and compassion. Uh, You'll have to check the episode out to hear more than that. But it's a really good talk. We really break down a lot of misconceptions about Christianity that I had, and I'm assuming a lot of other people have as well. And he just preaches the message of love, which is the message I want to preach, you know? That's, That's what every religion alludes to, is love. And that just somehow gets lost in the translation along the way. But it's a really fun conversation. We talk for quite a while and touch on a lot of really good topics. And he's just a really super knowledgeable guy. And I think you'll really enjoy the episode. So be sure to check it out. The audio was a little off in the beginning, but we got it fixed pretty quickly. So try to stick through the first couple minutes and it does get better. Um, If you do enjoy the show, please remember to go rate, review, and subscribe. Uh, preferably on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts at. And if you would like to contribute to the show to help keep it going, that can be done at uh, Venmo, that's at Dharma Junkie, or on Cash App, dollar sign, Dharma Junkie. Anyway, without further ado, Reverend Jeremy Sean Hall. This is an experiment, this is an experiment in, mind in mind formation. In formation. In formation. Forming, forming, controlling, controlling, operating your, operating mind, your mind and your brain. We're using digital We're using techniques, digital techniques to, overload, to overload, scramble, scramble, confuse, confuse, unfocus, unfocus your, mind, your mind. The natural state of the brain is chaos. Chaos, Chaos is beautiful. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, how are you doing? Let me see where I hid you. There we are. <laughs> there I am. I, I exist now. <laughs> I'm glad that I could provide you with existential validation. Hey, man. It, I'm glad somebody could. I haven't, <laughs> able, I haven't been able to do it for myself. <laughs> How's, uh, how's Pensacola? Man, it's Pensacola. You know, yeah. it doesn't change also, a whole like, lot. Sometimes really good, mostly really boring. Uh, you know, it's Pensacola. Yeah. It's like if you're into the beach, it's awesome. Yeah. But if you don't have time, if you don't have time for that, then, you know, what, what do you love? Then it's just Pensacola. <laughs> then you're left with ex- existential dread. There you go. Yeah, my folks still live there. They've been there 46 years. Hate the beach. You're a, you're a, it doesn't sound like it's coming through your, uh, your microphone. Like it sounds like it's coming through like maybe another audio source. Let me, yeah, yeah, you're right. Let me get call. Like maybe you're, you're that. one more time. Am I richer? Yeah, that's a lot better. Definitely better. Yeah. That's happened to me a few times and I didn't, okay. ca- I didn't catch it. I think I've got it set. Now. Yeah, there you go. That's perfect. Awesome. And uh, I'm I'm running through a mixer and whatnot over here, so you can <laughs> ask for any changes. I could tell by the microphone that you were you were probably running through a mixer. 
It's like he's I'm a pro fresh. He's got a four hundred dollars sure microphone. He's probably running to a mixer. I'm gonna go ahead and guess that that's that the sound that I'm hearing right now is probably not the sound that he is <laughs> intending to put out. I'm just gonna go ahead and assume that. That'd be right. fantastic. Do you release these with video? Uh, I'm going to this time. I'm going to this okay. is actually gonna be like the first one. So like, oh nice. Yeah, yeah. We're just gonna see how it goes. I don't. Know. I haven't, I haven't tried to do video yet, but I mean, Zoom saves all the video, so. Yeah, it'd be hilarious to release the video and people would see the sure and it would sound like I was talking through a tin can. That would just right. be the best thing ever. Right. Well, but we'll let them believe that. Like, I'm never buying that microphone. It's a horrible representation of that microphone. Right. <laughs> They'd be like, I'm, no. It's like, I don't understand why everybody uses these things. They sound like shit. The last podcast I listened to, the guy was using one and it sounded terrible. They must do a lot of stuff in post. Oh, gosh. And Pensacola is Pensacola. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't change too much. I've yeah. escaped, I've escaped a few times. Geronimo's curse and such. Here I am, back in Pensacola. Yep. The uh, it hasn't happened to me yet, but that's where all the grandparents are. Yeah. And we're about to have our second kid. And oh wow, a lot of help would be nice. Yeah, for sure. Where where you at right now? The the northernmost suburb of Atlanta. Oh yeah, Kennesaw, Georgia. Right on. Yeah. Right at the start of the AT. Yeah, yeah. I just was uh, just up there, like uh, in July. I was okay, in. Uh, awesome. I was in Blue Ridge. Yeah, yeah. That's about an hour north of me. Yeah, yeah. So we drove right through where you're at to get there. So that yeah, man, it's so beautiful up there. I love it up there. Yeah, it's great. You know, that's one of those places that if I could pick a place that I wanted to move to, that would be up. Yeah, that would definitely be in my like top three, top four that area yeah, it's, it's a good fun. part of the country and you're still even in blue ridge you're close enough to atlanta that if you were craving civilization you could do it right i think if you're up there you're probably not craving civilization too much though i think you've probably escaped there from some other form of civilization yeah most people in blue ridge are in blue ridge on pers- purpose yeah exactly you don't just wind up i mean you don't just end up in blue ridge you're there for a reason you're like uh, mm-hmm. running away from something i'm gonna go hide in the mountains <laughs> so how were you involved with the church so i have only ever been involved with the church um i so i'm i'm 31 years old with over 10 years of vocational ministry experience oh, wow. so raised in the church um extremely conservative fundamentalist evangelical brand that you're probably familiar with in Pensacola, Florida, um, and discerned a call to do this forever and pursued that. And it kept getting affirmed. So today I find myself as a a pastor of a wonderful little church in North Georgia. The, so there there's titles and there's job descriptions and there's what I actually do. Right. Um, Title wise, Reverend, I got I tricked someone into ordaining me, so I've got all the credentials. Um, did all the schooling, so I've got that standard preacher degree of a Master's of Divinity. Though I'm working on a Doctor of Ministry, which you will appreciate is a abbreviated as a demon, and we get we get way too much mileage out of that joke. <laughs> but <laughs> Doctors of Ministries all have demons. Um, but yeah, so I do the pastor thing up here at this church. If you call the church, I answer, if you're sick in the hospital, I'm probably the one that'll come visit. I preach from the pulpit every so often, um, all that stuff, um, job description wise, my title is associate pastor of faith development, which means my programmatic job is to make sure that classes happen, that people are having opportunities to learn and to engage and to develop their own faith and spirituality. Right. How, do, how does that, how did you get into that? I mean, obviously like I'm assuming your family was somehow involved with the church. You didn't just, I don't think anybody just at that age is like, this is my calling. I mean, I mean, I'm sure some people do, but it's, I don't think it's really that standard for someone that young to be like, I'm going into the ministry. Right. Well, there's, there are quite a few people that 
make that decision somewhere around high school, which is where it was for me. Hmm. I, like I said, was raised in the church and um, that experience had various levels of intensity depending on what, like we were regular attenders and then the left behind series came out and we became every time the door is open attenders kind of thing. There were ebbs and flows to the Christian life of my upbringing. So it was always a major part of what it meant to be a part of my family. Uh, But in high school, I started thinking maybe this is what I'm supposed to be. And that decision, that initial pull came out of like a really nasty self-righteousness that like, I take this more seriously than everyone else and I could do it better than you. Right. So I'm yeah. Right. (laughs) Praise (laughs) God that uh, I got that beat out of me. Um, I, the, someone asked me the other day, uh, what would you tell as third, it was my birthday. And they said, all right, you're 31. What would you tell 16 year old you? And the answer was basically nothing he'd listen to, uh, but probably just to chill out. Um, I was a perfect little fundamentalist. The Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. Um, The high school I went to, East Hill Christian in Pensacola, uh, uses Bob Jones hyper fundamentalist textbooks. Um, We use resources in class from things like Answers in Genesis. That's the guy out in Kentucky that built Noah's Ark. And you can go walk through the Ark and see the dinosaurs that he kept on the Ark. Like that's. I was in that version of Christianity. Oh, that's if you fun. Can't affirm a literal six day creation, then the cross is meaningless. That kind of BS right. is the version that I was uh, being put together in. And I took it more seriously than everyone else, or at least so I thought. And so I dug deeper and I kept working and I kept pursuing. And when you're that teenager who has that sort of zeal, mm get a lot of encouragement from the adults in that sphere. They, they see you as the next, the next generation of fundamentalist evangelical <laughs> jokes on them. Um, so I was encouraged in this direction. The more I pushed, the more I reached, mm. the, the more I was affirmed, though there were boundaries to that, obviously. There are questions you don't ask. There are subjects you don't explore. Let's um okay, like 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 let's talk about that. Let's talk about like what what are the in that ev- evangelical, like super evangelical dinosaur adventure land kind of world <laughs> that that we are don't in. pay your taxes, go to bu- dinosaur adventure land. Exactly. That place. <laughs> so if you're in that kind of world uh and you're from Pensacola, Florida, what are what are those questions? Like what what would what would you not be able to talk about, you know? Well, we certainly we don't ask questions about the field I find myself in today is Christian ethics. That's what my education uh, sort of veers into is the ethical philosophical world inside of theology. But those sorts of questions, they're settled. I've, I've had that conversation recently. I told someone asked me, what are you studying? And I said, ethics. And they looked at me very confused and they said, that field is settled. You don't ask new questions about how to live in the world. The Bible already gave us everything we need to know about gender roles. That's a big one in that world. The roles of women, uh, the place of sex, um, what to do about the three to 5% of humans that are not cisgendered or straight. Right. You don't talk about that because the Bible's already settled it. Um, You don't ask questions about other faith traditions. In the evangelical world, you don't ask questions against your own tribe. Like You're not supposed to question what the Southern Baptists are doing, or you're not supposed to question what the evangelical leaders are saying or teaching or doing, Um, because, I mean, that's the first step to Catholicism, and that's almost (laughs) as bad as dancing. Yeah, right. That's almost a Mennonite at that point. Right? (laughs) No dancing. No dancing. Absolutely. Somebody, yeah, that's, one, of my, one of my last guests had a really good, good uh, Mennonite joke. So why don't um, Mennonites have uh, sex standing up because they might end up dancing? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So 
the thing, you know, the, I'm not a Christian. I was raised, uh, I was raised Presbyterian. I went to first Presbyterian right there off of Gregory street. You know, I know it sure, well. I'm sure, you know, right, right where it's at. So I, I you know, I grew up in the church you know, and I'm under much duress. I was drugged there against my will, obviously, as most, most young children are. Um, I did not enjoy the experience very much. Um, let's say I saw some holes in the story of our, our Lord and savior, <laughs> not so, not so much, even Jesus. I believe Jesus for certain probably was a fantastic guy. I'm sure he existed and I'm sure he was an amazing dude. Uh, he seemed, he seems like somebody I'd hang out with. If we're being honest, I'd hang out with Jesus. Yeah. There you go. He seems like a really laid back kind of hippie guy, you know, until you talk about money and he's going to flip your tables over. But. So he's got ethics. Jesus definitely had ethics, but right? There's so much. How can I put this? There's the so much of a literal translation of the Bible and so much of Christianity. And, you know, for a book that was written so long ago, I think for people to have that really firm, like this is the way it was written. We're not deviating from this. Right. I see a lot of problems in that, you know, and I'm sure you do too. Uh, absolutely. Now, now, and now you do. It is a, it's a failure to understand the type of literature to read it literally. And that that's sort of the, the whole story of my deconstruction and my reconstruction is that the evangelical worldview gave me all the tools I needed to tear it down. It taught me to take the Bible deadly seriously, to follow Jesus no matter what he demanded or requested. Right. And that didn't match with the story I was being told. Right. And so it was the Bible itself that deconstructed my Christian worldview and brought me to a place where I could faithfully, at least in the best, most humble way I can, uh, I'd say I'm humbly confident, uh, live into this faith tradition and follow Jesus. Because you're right. If you, if you read the Bible literally, you're going to get confused because the writers aren't writing literally, and you're going to have a bad time. Right. It's going to make you do <laughs> things that aren't good. Right. It's going to make you believe things that don't make sense. And next thing you know, uh, you're not paying your taxes at Dinosaur Land, and you're scared of transfusions <laughs> and vaccines. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's and then always... your neighbor thinks you're crazy. And what good are you to your neighbor now? Right. That, that, that's an interesting point too. You know, it's the love thy neighbor thing. It's so many, you know, in my experience, just growing up down here and living down here, like I said, I've moved around a bit, but I always end up back here for some horrible reason, but growing up down here, like a lot, a lot of the really devout Christians are, I mean, I, you, you you know where I'm going with this. They're just not great people. Like <laughs> they're nasty. It, a lot of them are just nasty folks. Yeah. They, yeah, they are. They're, they're, they're mean. They're just mean. <laughs> like if you don't, I, if you're not, in was. Line, if you're not in line with their beliefs, they're, they're, they're militant and they're, they're just, they're nasty, man. Yeah. <sighs> There's when your whole worldview is based around having absolute certainty about anything right. you're gonna struggle but when it's absolute certainty about a literal interpretation of a thousands of year old book written in three languages on four continents by over two dozen authors ranging from kings right. to homeless people yeah. like you're gonna struggle maybe a little yeah and maybe just a little bit and people talk about people talk about the bible being full of contradictions mm. and for a lot of folks that breaks their sort of literal certainty, but something that I've discovered in my reconstruction is that I wouldn't say that the Bible is in a state of contradiction. It's in a state of conversation. Right. The authors are aware of each other frequently. Mm. They've read what the others have written and they're writing in response and in tradition and in chronological, they're chronologically experiencing something together. 
Mm. and responding to what they've heard and what they've learned and what they've seen. And sometimes they argue. And one of the strengths of the Bible is that that didn't get edited out. We left it in there. Right. You would, you would think with as much editing that was assuredly done with the Bible, mm. because I'm sure it was heavily edited before it ever, before anybody ever saw it, before it ever saw yes. the light of day, it was severely edited. And you cannot find an honest scholar that would disagree with you. Yeah. I, I don't see how you could, you know, like let's, I mean, just realistically, it doesn't seem feasible that it was not edited probably numerous times before anybody ever even knew what it was. And then, you know, you get down to like different power sets, editing it for their own purposes, you know, like the King James version, you know, and then, and then the message gets very skewed because things get left out. Things get omitted. Probably, I'm sure probably new things were added, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> It's just, it's all very chaotic and very confusing. And then it can be, yeah, it absolutely can be. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, you know, dissuaded me from it in, in the first place. Then just, you know, the way, like I said, the way people just take it literally, the literal translation of it is like this, that's, there's no way that's what they meant by, it. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there's certain parts of it where it's like, there's, come on, there's good message, probably not literal. Let's, you know, if we're getting right down to it, probably not literal. But, you know, if, for a book that's entire point was preaching the message of love, for it to get so skewed towards the opposite direction so frequently is troublesome, to yeah. say the least. You know, it's troublesome. You know, you, you have a religion that it's one of the most popular religions in the world. It's one of the most practiced religions in the world. And, you know, and then there's many different denominations and sects, but C Christianity as a blanket right. is, is widespread has been for thousands of years now. And for that many people to be practicing a, a religion whose message is love and to not be preaching that message and to be preaching a message of hate mm -hmm. in its place is just counterintuitive and just insanity to me. Yeah. Total failure. Yeah. Complete failure really dropped the ball on that one we um we've gotten it wrong frequently and continue to do so and i've gotten it wrong and continue to do so right and i'm doing my best to try to follow jesus that's why okay. repentance is such an important part of that experience well it seems like you're doing a good job well, thank you i mean but as involved as you are and you, you seem like you've got your head screwed on pretty straight comparatively like especially being a Christian from Pensacola, but see, there you, you go. Also, yeah, <laughs> you also said no offense to all the Christians in Pensacola. Well, maybe a few of them, but but you we also can said offend that, some of them. But you also said that you weren't always that way. That you were that really militant evangelical Christian for a long time. See, I can't even see that person existing within you now. So, like, what was that journey like for you? Yeah. So those there's pieces of him that are still here. They're oh, absolutely. on. On my worst days, in my weaker days, and under stress, I can slip back into that mindset because it's easy. That's that's the thing that's so appealing, I think, for folks about that fundamentalist, hyper-conservative, evangelical way of seeing the world is it's easy and it makes you important. You've got all the secrets. It's like a conspiracy theory kind of thing. Right. You're special. You know the secret. You have the answers. Right. You're the only one who has it right. That's that's easy to get excited about. Especially, especially for a young person who knows it all, right? Yeah. So I, I was raised in that sort of environment and cultural movements in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, when I'm sort of coming of age, like the uh the Left Behind series and into the world fervor um, drove me deep into through fear. It scared me uh, into church and into taking it so terribly seriously. Right. Um, and I, I obviously sitting in my church office uh, in front of a wall of theology and Bibles and such still take it pretty seriously. Um, but in a, in a different sort of way. Um, and so they, 
I was formed into a really, a really, I, I was the ideal product of those systems. I was certain, even when, even when I knew it was wrong, things like uh, literal six day creation. I cared about science and such. I was a nerd. I, I read uh, science texts. I also read books that I got from uh, the local Christian college that explained how dinosaurs weren't real, but I liked, I still liked dinosaurs. Right. right. So there, <laughs> there was a lot of tension. And when you tried to ask those questions, you would get answers like, well, you, we believe what the Bible says, or sometimes things are there to test you, or that's the world trying to confuse you, or that's Satan trying to get into your life. You're giving Satan a foothold by watching Bill Nye because he talks about evolution. Um, danger, danger there. <laughs> so I, I leave for college as that sort of person. Mm -hmm. And being away from it sort of starts to soften my position on things that I still believe the same things, right. but my behavior softens, you know, like you, you can be a polite racist or a polite homophobe. Right. I was sort of in that camp now mm. uh, to where I didn't want to hurt gay people. I just knew they were going to hell. And if they asked, I would tell them out in my mind, out of love, I don't want you to go to hell. <laughs> I want you to understand that you are living in open, willful rebellion against God who has made you straight cisgendered and you are choosing out of some sort of sinful excess, a life of rebellion against nature and God. And I, I want you to, to change. I want you to come back to your senses, right. return to God Come home and, to your family. Right? Right. <laughs> so, but I wasn't going out and leading with that right. anymore. So I was softening on these yeah. things. And yeah, probably wasn't very successful with leading with that. Probably didn't, probably <laughs> didn't work very well. Just saying. Yeah, I didn't make a lot of friends that way. <laughs> no, I, I can and imagine not. <laughs> just to, to, to I'm going to jump ahead in the story for a second and circle back. But when I changed my mind on the quote LGBTQ question, mm. I didn't have any gay friends <laughs> for good reason. I wasn't safe. Right. I was a dangerous person to be around. I could hurt you. I wouldn't mean to, but right. the posture I walked in was hostile. Yeah. Um, so like you say, you didn't, it didn't work to lead with it and just sort of, putting a, a silk glove over the hand that held the brick didn't do much good either, but it did make people think I was liberal. So that was kind of fun. That's what it's like to be an evangelical edgelord is to have people think <laughs> you're slightly liberal because you don't lead with how much the gays suck. Um, right. That's, it's gotta be like a key talking point for the end. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, and maybe, you know, I'm not an evolutionist, but Maybe God guided micro evolution and adaptation. That's some serious evangelical edge lord for you right there. So I'm sort of in that space when I get to college. I went to Samford University in Birmingham, a good Baptist college, though, with people warned me that religion department, it is liberal. They do critical analysis and, you know, they read the Bible like lit it's literature and things like that. They're not all Southern Baptists in there, but I went to Samford and got into the religion department and was studying Bible theology, church history, right. um, in order to be ready for a life of ministry. Cause this is the way I was going. And they started pulling on those threads that weren't quite tight enough for me. They did what a good liberal arts education should do. They exposed the holes in my, in my knowledge base, um, offered me new perspectives from history and theology and sociology um, and philosophy, things I hadn't seen before. Right. They, they took the, the diamond, the prism 
that was my faith and turned it in angles that I hadn't before and I could see it differently right. and see the product of it differently. It reflected and it refracted in new ways that were sometimes frightening and sometimes painful. And for a while, I thought it was like a game. Like they're, they're testing me and I'm going to, I, my job is to like prove that my worldview is still right. right. I have, I have on my shelf back here, a textbook from my first, the first textbook I used in the uh, theology classes. Mm. They let me somehow my first class as a freshman was a 300 level theology course that I shouldn't have been able to get into. I didn't have the prereqs. Right. And they gave me this upper level theology textbook about what happened on the cross. It's just a study of models of atonement, different opinions mm. on what Jesus actually did when he died. What was that? And I, I've kept the textbook and I look at it every so often to remind me not to be such an arrogant prick. I went through it and made notes about how everyone who disagreed with me was wrong. <clears throat> and right. Cause the freshman knows what he's doing. Oh yeah. First sure. class freshman, 8 AM on a Monday morning writing like, Nope. On the intro to a textbook. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I had been warned. I'd been warned about liberal professors, even at Baptist colleges, that there were liberal professors out there that wanted to lead me astray. Yeah, they're everywhere. <laughs> but through that process of learning what the Bible was, how it actually works, learning about genres, learning about the editing process, getting to actually see the Bible in the light that it shines on itself. Because mm. it, the evangelical tradition sometimes on purpose, but sometimes accidentally obscures the Bible from itself. We lift it out of its context and bring it to us like it was for us or rather to us something. I get to work with teenagers and college students a lot here uh, at my church. And something that I remind them when they're kind of stuck in the weeds is that while the Bible is written for them, it was not written to them. A third of the new Testament is someone else's mail. <laughs> and if you right, that's a good way to put it. And they're that's conversations really that it. we only have one half of. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't have, there's so, no context involved. There's no context. Right. So you have to go and find it. But if you read Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, mm. like it's Paul's only letter to Pensacola or Atlanta, you're going to be very confused and it can lead you to making bad decisions. Absolutely. While the Bible is for you, it was not written to you. This is one of the reasons why churches need well-educated clergy uh, ministers who know what they're doing. I humbly hope to be among them. My, my seminary has two uh, slogans, quotes from the founder of our school. I, I study at the McAfee School of Theology, part of Mercer University. So it's named for Jesse Mercer, and there's a statue out in front of our seminary. And there's some quotes in front of him. And one of them is, God save us from an ignorant ministry. And my favorite one is, surely there must be some Baptists who can be trusted. <laughs> and that's, that's been my mantra for a long time. Be a Baptist who is trustworthy. Right. Yeah. Good luck. But, yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it's an uphill battle. Yeah. Yeah, I can the, imagine uh, so. I can imagine so. Especially... Our, I, I mean, it's got to get easier as time goes by, right? I mean, which part? Just, just all of it. Like trying to deliver like a pure message through all the, for lack of a better term, um, and part of my language, bullshit. You know? Yeah. Because the more you see it, once you see the bullshit, you won't step in it anymore. Right. Well, I mean, my, my point was kind of like, you know, you have this old, it's just the same thing with politics. There's this old guard, well, any, any structure of power, let's say, whether it be political, whether it be religious, whether it be educational, you've got all these, these power structures that were installed and they were installed years and years ago. And then you've, but as time goes by, we, you know, we get more, we get more understanding, we get more knowledge, we get more liberal in our thinking and not, I don't mean liberal by, you know, Democrat, yeah, yeah, yeah we're not talking like, I mean, democrats well, i mean and like the, the literal definition of the word we get more liberal with our thinking and 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 some i think some of the the 
some of the stuff kind of falls away, you know, like we were like, okay, well that doesn't really apply anymore. And we, as, as a, a modern group of say evangelicals or a modern group of Baptists, like we can move away from that, but you don't really see that a lot. You see it in some religions, but not so many others. You see a lot of religions and structures of power, you know, the, like we can look at like a uh, marijuana legalization for instance, in, in the political realm that would have never been possible 30 mm-hmm. years ago. And I mean, that was entirely based off of some William Randolph Hearst, Harry J. Anslinger's propaganda. That yeah, racism. And racism. It was, you know, likely there was no reason to make marijuana illegal in the first place, but it was. And then you get this stigma that goes down through the generations and through the generations. And then, you know, you're told that, and, you know, it'll fucking kill you. It'll kill you. And your, your feet will fall yeah. off and you'll go crazy. You'll be addicted. Yeah. You'll be hopelessly addicted. And then you're a reefer addict. And, you know, and that was just insanity. And you, but you see the same kind of thing in religion. You know, you get all these, these ideas that were put in place like many, many years ago, you know, that are just antiquated. And like, as we grow as a culture and as we grow as people, we can look at these things and say, okay, this probably wasn't the right decision to make. It, maybe it was at the time, but the times have changed. So mm-hmm. how does like how does Christianity move with the times? That's kind of my question. Yeah. You, you seem to be doing a good job with that. You seem to be you if you could go from where you were at when you were going into college, the writing no on the first <laughs> intro chapter. Nope, not that wrong. And now I'm excommunicated from the Southern Baptists. Oh, are you? Yes. Oh wow. <laughs> Kicked all the way out. <laughs> oh man. See, they're so such understanding people. Yes, the um, and uh, it, <laughs> there's a whole story there. There's a piece of that story that's happening in the news today. Oh, let's have. Um, I, I love good stories. The um, so this is this is jumping ahead in the the timeline a little bit, uh, but the person so Townview, my my congregation mm-hmm. in 2019, um, some thing about Baptist life. Baptist churches, when they're functioning properly, are pure democracies. Mm -hmm. I am a member of my church as well as its pastor. Um, I have one vote. All members have one vote. Mm -hmm. And every most of our work is in simple democracies, simple majority. A few things like hiring a new pastor require a supermajority, but mostly 51% wins because it's a democratic system. We're kind of the libertarians of the church world. It's kind of our whole shtick, but we forgot that and became totalitarians somehow. But yeah, when it's working properly, Baptist life is all about freedom and democracy. So we voted in 2019 to welcome LGBTQ members into our congregation. Full members, no caveat, no asterisk. No if right. ands or buts. We included yeah, the phrase without exception yeah, and why in the we? actual policy. Yeah. And it took till mostly because of the pandemic, it took the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest uh, Protestant denomination in the world. Mm. If the Roman Catholics weren't around, they'd be the largest, um, the largest Protestant denomination in the world uh, kicked us out this year, uh, 2021. Early in the year, the executive committee met and kicked out six churches um, on the basis of sexual immorality. So that's why I got kicked out of the church for sexual immorality, for welcoming uh, a family with two dads into my church. Um, Of the six churches they threw out, four had pastors that had committed uh, sexual offense crimes uh, in their church. Mm. And then two of us had welcomed gay members and they grouped it all together. And it was very important to the executive that we were all one thing that we weren't the two of us doing LGBT inclusion. Yeah. Yeah. And as you may be aware, the SBC is currently being investigated for uh, sexual crimes. um, And there's the idea that the people at the top have been covering up uh, for all of their buddies in the boys club. I know, right. They never do that. Well, I've never heard of such a thing occurring in the church. That's insane. (laughs) Earlier this month, (laughs) the legal defense team for the SBC, they all quit. The people that were supposed to protect them Uh against these allegations, they all left. They said, we can't do this. You know, 
I think that alone speaks volumes when you, yeah. Yeah. You and know, today, I mean, like just, just like that, that, right? says, that says a lot. It's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. The defense lawyers found it indefensible. Um, and then today, uh, the man named Ronnie Floyd, who is the head of the executive committee, basically the most powerful player and the most powerful body in the most powerful denomination uh -huh. resigned with his entire staff. Oh, wow. His whole office resigned today um, under these concerns about sexual immorality, which is what he kicked us out for today. So this, yeah, it just October happened today. It's breaking news. Wow. That's crazy. Boom, you heard it here first, people. Yeah. <laughs> Dharma the, junkie breaking Baptist news, news since 2021. Dharma. Absolutely. Moving into new territory. <laughs> That's crazy, man. Wow. Yeah, I had no idea any of that was even going on. And you know, why would I? I'm so far removed from that world. You know, like I, I don't even really watch the news. Yeah, most church people honest. don't know what's going on. I'm just a nerd. No, yeah, I, I was about to say probably even uh, most even Baptists probably didn't even know a lot of that was going on because yeah. you know they just show up to church on Sunday and think that that's what they got to do and that's it. That's enough. Mm -hmm. it's a lot of the scandal's going to come to light soon, though. Uh, I'm sure it is. I'm what sure is it done is. in the dark will be revealed in the light. Mm -mm -mm. That's crazy, man. That's absolutely crazy to me. But yeah, it's, it's so you were kicked out for saying no. That's fine. We welcome everyone here. Please yeah. come to our church. We love you. Huh? See, right? That's, that's my problem. That's always been that's always been my problem with Christianity. Because, save for you know a few set denominations, you know, like Unitarians and and the one you grew up in. Uh, first is uh, First Presbyterian is a PCUSA church. Right. They were one of the first mainline denominations to welcome uh, gay members and gay clergy. Right. And, 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 why would, and why wouldn't they? You know, I mean, I'll wait the Bible because of the. Well, literal, it depends on how you read the Bible. Because of a literal translation of the Bible. Yes. Like exactly like we were talking about. It's not even so like my. It's not even, probably not even a literal translation. It's probably. How did this, how did this come about? Because I'm sure you know. How did how did we get so far off from yeah. the course in which we were intended to go with with Christianity? I may or may not be doing a doctorate on this. So if I start going like, so I'm a preacher who's studying these things. So if I start preaching or oh, man, lecturing, let us have it. Cut me off. Let us have it. So there are six verses, six passages in the Bible that potentially talk about. Uh, same-sex relations, uh, LGBTQ issues. Um, six verses that are used in the LGBTQ question discussion. Uh, they are referred to frequently as the clobber passages because we use them to beat the crap out of people. There's two in Leviticus. There's one in Genesis. There's uh, one in Romans, one in 1 Corinthians, and one in 1 Timothy. Uh, so three in the Old Testament, three in the New Testament. Uh, you're familiar. You, most of your listeners will be familiar with most of these. A few of them in the New Testament might be viewed as a little more obscure. Mm. Uh, in Genesis, we find the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. Which, for ridiculous reasons, has sort of captured the evangelical imagination. When you have the discussion, when... It comes up in evangelical circles, in conservative circles, um, in fundamentalist circles. That's the narrative that sort of holds the story together for them is Sodom and Gomorrah. Fire, brimstone, total destruction right. in response to total depravity. But that story's not about gay people at all. <laughs> the, in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, God Here's the cry of injustice. One of the key points of the Old Testament is that when people cry out uh, over injustice, God responds. God always hears the cry, even when it's against God's own people. There's another interesting thing about the Bible's editing process. The Bible didn't edit out when the people of God got it so wrong that God had to punish them. The uh, kingdoms of Israel and Judah are destroyed because they are failing to live uh, and carry out justice 
they've become oppressors. And so God has to liberate the people that the people of God are oppressing. Fascinating that we never talk about it that way. Anyway, God hears that the city of Sodom is full of violence and injustice. And so he sends angels to investigate. Angels arrive at the city disguised as men, and they expect to receive traditional Middle Eastern hospitality. As foreigners, as guests, as travelers, they should be safe to camp out in the city because that's how it works. But they're not. A man named Lot, who's the the good guy in this story, Mm -hmm. goes to them and says, you must come stay with me. It's not safe to stay out here. And they protest, but eventually gets them inside. And we're told every man in the city, every man (laughs) in the city shows up at Lot's house, bangs on his door and demands to rape the angels. (laughs) This is a story about attempted gang rape of angels, not about two dads or two moms. It's every man in the city. Every man in the city was gay. That would be weird. Maybe they just um, all had an angel fetish. Right? Maybe. Uh, we, But it wasn't... I don't think it was about sex at all because Lot does something truly horrific. The good guy in the story mm. offers his two daughters. He says, I have two virgin daughters. I, I have two teenage daughters. I will give them to you if you will go away and you can do whatever you want with them. Every man in the city has shown up so sex-crazed that all of them want to have a rape orgy with these strangers, but none of them want the young women. This isn't about sex. This is a story about power. Hmm. They want to show these foreigners what happens to foreigners who come to their city. Right. Yeah. It sounds more like a xenophobia story than a homophobia story. And here's the thing we have, this is Sodom, sodomy. This has captivated our imagination. It has captivated our language. I like the word captive eight. Here because we're trapped in this tradition. Yeah. When the Bible, the Bible talks about Sodom four more times mm. and it never mentions sex. Um, I don't have my notes in front of me, but I think it's Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jesus mention Sodom. And the, the reasons that they say it was destroyed was for its injustice, for its failure to welcome strangers, for being a place of violence. Jesus says Sodom was destroyed because it failed to receive the messenger, messengers of God. None of them mention being gay or gay sex or anything having to do with sex or sexuality or gender. And that's how the Bible interprets the story. Right. That one needs to get thrown out of the discussion. Okay. I agree. I agree. So Leviticus. Uh Leviticus, you've heard these before. This is where you have that word abomination. Mm -hmm. I feel gross just saying it. Um, I did a, I was a guest on a podcast uh, last week with a, um, a a young gay man who's in the process of trying to pick up the pieces of his faith. And I got really emotional just having to read those verses in his presence Mm because they've been so weaponized. Right. And maybe that makes me a weenie or something, but I like, I I had to apologize for saying abomination because it's so horrible. I think it makes you a human being. I appreciate that commentary. (laughs) I've been called worse things than that today. Um, I think it makes you beautiful, man. I think it does. Yeah. I honestly, I mean, that's, that's what, that's what this, your faith is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about love and acceptance. I think so, Justin. And, and the thing is, you look at these Leviticus passages, mm-hmm. and there's two of them. There's one in 18, and then it comes up again in 21, or it's 19 and 21. Once again, I don't have my notes in front of me. Mm-hmm. I can send you notes later. Um, these passages both say something similar, and it goes like, and you've heard it a million times, a man shall not lie with a man is with a woman, for it is an abomination. Right. Uh, in one of these versions of this i think it's the 21 it says they shall be put to death i think it's interesting that the evangelicals aren't petitioning in mass to kill the lgbt community off uh though this passage has been used to justify horrific violence yeah um the passages are actually pretty confusing they sound clear in english 
but the Hebrew is a bit difficult. Hmm. The that nouns is, that, for man that just sounds like an anti adultery and, message and to woman. Me. They don't line up. It says something like a husband shall not lie with mankind as he does his wife. Um, one of them uses the phrase. Right. I mean, yeah. yeah. It, it, one of them specifically says mm-hmm. a man shall not lie in the marriage bed of his wife with humanity is how that reads. Yeah. I mean, that seems like good advice. Mm-hmm. And it's a really specific phrase. Isha Mishkavin. The marriage bed of your wife. It only happens twice in scripture. The other time is about mm. adultery. So maybe that's what's going on here. Um, conservative rabbis point out that the fact that there's no mention of female to female same sex mm. attraction makes it seem like this isn't a blanket statement about same sex attraction. Um, right. A lot of more conservative I Jewish mean, that commentaries, is the literal definition not of Christian sodomy. commentaries bring up sex this is probably the, about the spilling of seed yeah. more than it, it's about sex that doesn't cause procreation that that's might be the primary concern and right non-procreative sex yeah um and mm-hmm. they point out that leviticus is about how to live as a jew in the holy land also the nasty word and i think this is fascinating the nasty word abomination, if you go and you pick up a popular English translation of the Bible, like the NIV, um, it will translate, the, mm. the word there is toava. The Hebrew word toava, in right. these two passages, it will translate to abomination. A man shall not lie with a man as with right. a woman, for it is an abomination unto the Lord. In English, the word abomination means something grotesque mm. or to be hated. And so when we read that, that is what yeah, we bring to sense. this conversation. Yeah. The Hebrew word that's, being translated so Toava, does yeah. not mean something <laughs> grotesque or to be hated. It's more akin to the word mm. taboo. Why is it right? Oh, this gets more interesting. Huh. Hang on. Check this out. When the word Toava comes up in the Hebrew, mm. modern English translations don't always translate it to abomination. They contextualize. Right. There's two prominent ones that I think really matter to clarify this. In the Exodus narrative, when Moses is saying to Pharaoh, let my people go. You all know this story. The Early in the debate between Moses and Pharaoh, Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people leave for a while now there's some tr- there's uh, some things point to a trickster reading here. A lot of times the God in the early Old Testament is a trickster and mm. leads his people to be tricky. Um, maybe Moses is trying to sneak the Hebrews away and Jason they won't Jay. come back. But he says, "We'll come back. You need to let us go into the wilderness so that we can have a festival to worship our God, and then we will return." And Pharaoh said, yeah, Mm. Pharaoh says, no, that sounds like a bad choice for me. But hey, how about this? I will let you worship however you want here in your ghettos, in in your communities. You can have a festival however you want to have it. Well, yeah, you might have. I don't remember. Might have offered to furnish it. And Moses says, no, it would be Tova to worship God here. It would be an abomination to worship God. No, it would be taboo to worship Mm. God in Egypt. Another one in Deuteronomy, God tells Moses to tell the people, if an animal die, if one of your livestock dies of natural causes, do not eat it. This is a kosher law for you. It is toava, an abomination. Yeah, I I wouldn't think so. Give it freely to the foreigner, the immigrant, the sojourner in your land. I mean, personal. Did thing, God personal just thing. tell <laughs> God's people to trick the vulnerable into sin? Right. No. <laughs> right. And and so it's not right. Wasn't it? Wasn't it? In, and so English translations don't in use the Leviticus word as well. They're, they're, abomination. That there? You find like don't eat shellfish. They translate it to that, something like that, unclean, yeah. abnormal, or taboo. Mm. It would be 
out of right right yes and so other things that are a toava potentially an abomination potentially if you followed the train of thought on lgbtq issues that start here an abomination a sin that sends you straight to hell isn't that includes well? putting cheese on your burger <laughs> not keeping kosher eating game meat like rabbit shellfish barbecue pork um working right. on saturday or the sabbath so yeah you can't mix fabrics uh, if you have um sex with yeah. a woman too that's, close see, to see, her that's period so that's an abomination straight to, to hell like you're gonna take, there's it's, quite it's a the, few yeah, and we are hung up on those and you're taking we are hung up on abominations listed in the same is, chapter as, as we're interpreting an abomination which yeah awful word awful word yes yeah, something has gone wrong in the context that it's being used and is it you know what you're saying is that is essentially is the the hebrew translation is more something along the lines of taboo so you're saying yeah okay these things are taboo and they're they're frowned upon but they're are they, are they a damnable offense right and you have to you think about context even if if the law of leviticus is perfectly representative of what god said to moses right and I take the Bible incredibly seriously and I am unwilling to throw any part of it out. So I have to, when I read Leviticus, I must do something with it. Even if it is perfectly, exactly what God said to Moses, the people that God was talking to were a nomadic tribe in an agrarian society who had just escaped slavery, did not know how to live as humans did not right. know how to live yeah. in community and didn't have enough people yeah. yeah they needed an army and they needed enough people to farm an agrarian economy right yeah it was there to protect you needed to make humans right. it was there to protect the, essentially the family unit and, and yeah i mean everything that everything that we just talked about was essentially there to protect people like yeah don't eat that because you know we're talking about a time where there is no refrigeration we're talking about a time where pork could spoil very easily we're talking about a time where shellfish could spoil very easily it's like yeah don't eat that that's not good don't do that don't and don't do this because if you do that then you're not going to be able to make babies and then you're not going to be able to secure yourself as a race of people yeah i mean that that's the way i've interpreted it my entire life was like these are protectionary these are these put yeah. in place to protect you from yourself basically but not in a a damnation sense more in like a yeah your life's probably going to suck pretty bad if you do that <laughs> yeah. yeah the um and so it's it's been fascinating to me as i and this is the key this is the linchpin to my transformation on the lgbtq inclusion question mm -hmm. cuz i take the bible so seriously yeah. and then i learned greek and hebrew and it didn't say what I had been told it said. Right. And so I take the Bible seriously. So I had to do something. I, I'm not the only person who this has happened to. Oh, I'm sure. But I mentioned I didn't have any gay friends mm -hmm. when this transformation happened in my heart. When I think the Holy Spirit did something in me, right. I didn't have gay friends. I didn't discover uh, some experience in myself. Uh, where I realized I wasn't cis or straight. I didn't have a family member or close friend come out. My heart didn't go first. My head did. I made the decision intellectually, and I was furious about it. This did not make me happy for a long time, because I want to be a Baptist pastor. Right. This was going to ruin my career, and in some ways has extremely limited my career. I do not have people banging down the door uh, to have me come be their pastor um at least not in my tradition right uh because i identify as a baptist this is where i want to be yeah. yeah this is it hasn't been the best for me i've been i've been accused when when this happened in our church that this was about me trying to build my career or me trying to become famous uh, or any of any nonsense like that that is about getting a book deal right i'm not in the first 
several million to make this decision. We're, our church is not in the first million to make this decision. And even though we did get some attention because we got kicked out of the convention, um, we're not famous. It hasn't benefited me financially. It hasn't benefited the church in any uh, physical, traditional success metric. We have received incredible blessing through it. Right. We've become a place of life and love and redemption. Who would have thought? Mm -hmm. But it's not good for the bank. It's not good for attendance. Yeah, yeah I can imagine. But maybe it could be eventually. You know, I think you're. I think, maybe someday. I think, well, I think you're going to draw a lot of people in because most assuredly there is a an a fairly broad cross section of very confused LGBTQ Christians that are looking for a home mm -hmm. and they don't have one. So many people went in in this congregation. People I loved. When we started just talking about this, mm. so I do I do want to circle back to the other three New Testament passages because I think they're really important too. Please do, yeah. and I think you'll really appreciate it. Absolutely. But the yeah. um, when we started the process here, um, because God brought to us that this is ha what we believe happened one summer, in the summer of twenty eighteen, mm. somehow. God brought several same-sex couples into our church and they visited and they worshiped and they made friends and they went to Sunday school, but they weren't members. And that's where the line is. Right. A lot of Southern Baptist churches have gay folks in the building that are there, who are regulars, but they can't be members. Right. They can't be part of the family. They can't vote. They can't lead. They can't teach. They can't pray. They're second class. There's a stained glass ceiling for them. Yeah. So that, and that's how it was here. And we ha started having the conversation with one of the couples who asked, is there any path to us being part of the family? And. How do you say no to that? Exactly. You know, like, how do you say you no to somebody who's just looking to belong? Two dads who have adopted three sons. Wow. This is the gay agenda. This is people wanted to talk to me about the gay agenda. Here's the gay agenda. They wanted to make it to soccer practice on time, be able to feed their kids, go to work, and come to church on Sunday and hear about Jesus. Right. Sounds They terrible. wanted their kids to go to Sunday school. Yeah, they sound like awful people. <laughs> Abominations um, indeed. Yeah. Horrible. And horrible sound honestly they sound like really stand-up people and they sound they're like incredible yeah uh, they, that's what they said that's what it sounds like it sounds like they're incredible people who are just looking for a place to belong and and love that's what we have found in welcoming the the lgbtq christian community mm -hmm. is pent up passion love for a church that has rejected them that they haven't rejected Right. That people who the church threw out, but they didn't throw out Jesus. Right. Yeah. That's the sort of revival that that has brought here for us. For me, mm -hmm. I've learned how to worship from my gay friends Yeah, who know things about love and suffering that I don't. Right. And who have been gracious and patient enough to be my friend and my brother and sister and to give me the honor of being their pastor. Yeah. It's beautiful. That, that has brought so yeah. much life to my faith. It breaks my heart for the people that can't see it. Right. Well, you know, there's, I actually just wrote a paper about this not that long ago. I'm a, I'm a Dharma practitioner. I don't like to call myself a Buddhist per se, but if, I mean, basically that's what I am, but I, I wrote a paper. I had to write a paper about love. And I think just in, in Western culture, and I mean, we could, we could probably blanket Christianity with that too, but I, it seems to me like in Western culture, there's, there's a misunderstanding of, of the definition of love and, and in Western culture, there's this really, it focuses on attachment. You know, it's love is between a man and a woman or, um, and you it, love things, it, right? You love, you love people and you love things. I love my wife. I love tacos, but not equally. 
And that's the thing is like that love is not equal. See, in in the Dharma, you know, there's the the four noble truths and the eightfold path, and and there's um what's called the the heart practices, which are uh, referred to as the Brahma Viharas. It's the divine abodes. I'm I'm, I'm sure if you know it. You've probably read a little bit on on, on this. I've um, I've read. I'm sure. Um, well, the, the divine abodes are are Meta or loving kindness, Karuna, which is compassion, Mudita, which is appreciative joy, and um, I think I missed one. Uh, Meta, Meta, Karuna, Mudita, Upeka. That's three. Upeka, which is equanimity, and that's like that's where love is at. You know, it's like it, it's translated as loving kindness, but it's more just a friendliness. It's more just a love for every, all beings, you know, I, not just human beings, but all beings. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a real love, you know, it, it's a non-attached, not because, because love's not selfish. And I think in the, in Western culture, love gets selfish. I think, you know, that's, you get a lot of ego. It becomes a, a tool of consumerism it, it com- and it becomes a tool of power. I think that in Western mm. culture, love is a tool of power when that's exa- the exact opposite of what it is. Right. Well, love is the antidote for hatred, you know. That, that yeah. that's what love is. You know, they can't coexist. Is, they can't fit in the same space. Yeah, love is you know, love, and is, fear love is compassion. Cannot. Love is compassion, and it's compassion for all living things. It's putting yourself and empathizing with other people, and and being able to to, for lack of a better term, do a thought experiment and put yourself in their shoes and be like, okay, this is a person just having a human experience. And mm-hmm. I accept that for what it is, and I love them no matter what. Yeah, that's not always easy to do, especially brought up in Western society, and you know, being taught the way we are. You know, love is such a—it's used for control so much. You know, and that's that's always bothered me. Yeah, if yeah, love can't be a weapon, or it becomes something else. Yeah, yeah. and I think it gets weaponized a lot. You know, and especially, you know, the conversation we're having, it's, it's okay to love these people, but not these people. Right. And, and the justification for the exclusion is love. They, the folks, the folks that left this church Mm. will tell you that they did so out of love, that it is unloving to welcome the same sex parents or the the uh, the trans individual or the the young bisexual woman who's trying to figure out uh, what relationships look like for her as she's learning about herself that it would not be loving to not tell them they're going to hell because <laughs> they believe completely that they are going to hell and if that's true I mean they're right. If I know that you are bound for hell with a thousand percent certainty, if I don't try to do something to right. let you know, right. I must hate you. Yeah. But they've they have askewed the definition. There's a uh, a piece of art that I don't have it up right now. There is a piece of art that rotates on my wall from an artist called the Naked Preacher. Mm. I don't know who they really are. That's their pen name. And it's got Jesus arguing with the Pharisees as they are so prone to do. And Jesus says, you know what your problem is? You use the law to define love. And I use love to define the law. Yes. And that that's the whole game. Yep. yep. You start with love. If it doesn't look like Jesus, it's wrong. If your outcome isn't love, it's wrong. Jesus is very clear. You know a tree by its fruit. You know what you've done is right if it bears something good. Right. And this the traditional stance when when I start the conversation with someone about inclusion, I start with homeless kids. In Atlanta, there are at any given moment documentable 5 to 700 homeless LGBTQ youth on the street in the city. Mm. That is my fault. That is our fault as the church. We have done something to the culture that has caused those kids to get kicked out of their homes. Right. The suicide rate among adolescent 
uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender folks is horrifyingly high. Oh yeah. The, the report, the, the levels of depression they report are so askewed. The levels of fear they report are so abnormal. That is on the church and we have to repent. We have to name it and we have to repent of it. And then we have to do something to fix it. Right. Because the tree has borne bad fruit. If the fruit is homelessness and depression and suicide and exclusion and death and self-loathing, that's not Jesus. Well, you only get those kinds of fruit by planting those kinds of seeds. And that sounds like hate to me. So like you only get hate fruit by planting, but by planting hate seeds, you can only cultivate hatred by planting hatred. You can only cultivate love by planting love. Right. They they speak extensively about this in the, in the poly canon as well. There's, there's not an actual word for meditation in the poly language. There's a word that's called bhavana and that word trans because, you know, we're talking about 2,500 years ago in India, you know, there's, there were there was a lot of farming going on, a lot of livestock, a lot of cultivation. And that's what the word bhavana means. It's cultivation. So you don't, there's no real meditation word in the Pali language, but there's cultivation. So you cultivate these mind states, you meditate with the, you cultivate the Brahmi Baharas, you cultivate these divine abodes and these heart spaces. So you plant seeds of love and you grow love fruit. Yeah. You know, you, you, grow, um... you plant seeds of hate, you're going to grow hate fruit, you know? And like, it's just, the mind has a tendency to incline itself to what you surround it with. So yeah. if you, you know, you're doing nothing but positive things and delivering positive messages, you're going to reap nothing but positive fruit. But, you know, and it's fun we, when we talk about heaven and hell, you know, we can talk about it in a literal sense, but, you know, even Jesus said the kingdom of heaven lies within. And for me, what that means is that heaven and hell aren't geographic locations. They're not places you go. They're places you exist. Mm. And not necessarily in the afterlife, but right now. So, you know, if you, if you surround yourself with positivity and love, you're, you're going to live a heavenly life. If you surround yourself with negativity and hatred, you're going to, you're going to live, you're going to live in hell. So almost counterintuitively by trying to save these people from hell, you're directly, not you obviously, but the Christian faith has directly propelled these people into Mm -hmm. a life of hell. I have, I have caused hell you don't for now. other people. You don't now. And that's the important thing is yes, you have. And the fact that you can admit that freely and openly on a, on a, you know, and something like this, you know, that's going to be broadcast to the world. I mean, the world's obviously not going to see it, not the entirety of the world, but several people will, <laughs> you know, so the, but the fact that you can say that, that you have, and also the <laughs> fact that you can say you have, and, but you don't now, and you've, you have seen the error in your ways and you have adjusted for that. And there are people I've had to apologize to. Oh, I'm there, sure. Yeah. Uh, there's sort of like an AA thing. Uh, I had to hunt down some folks that were afraid of me and ask for their forgiveness. Some of them wouldn't talk to me because I was dangerous and they knew right. I was dangerous. Did a ninth step on them, huh? Major, yeah. Major, had to write major some amends. letters. Major amends. <laughs> There you yeah. go. Yeah. Thank you for just a quick aside. Thank you for sharing the, um, that language piece about meditation, the, uh, Buddhist meditation center, uh, here in Kennesaw, one of the leaders mm-hmm. who I've met says, uh, uh, let us tend our gardens, right. Tend the part an of invitation the to touch. meditation. Yeah. You tend the I, part of the garden you can touch. That's so cool. Right. Now I know what's going on. There you go. <laughs> yeah. No, I I'm, as much as you have been a nerd about the Bible, I am a nerd about the Pali Canon. I'm a I'm a huge Buddhist nerd. I I, I stay in the suttas pretty pretty deep <laughs> because it just it Very makes cool. it just makes sense to me, you know. Yeah, like, like and uh, with Buddhism, you know, it, it's it's called a religion, but like there's no, it's not a theistic religion. It's it's just more like a guide to living. It's lived, a, a lived philosophy. I've right. Heard it said. It, yeah. Exactly. It's just a, it's a wise way to live. You know, it's like, if you, if you live in this manner, your life will improve rather, you know, it's really just a reduction in reactivity to things. Pretty much. And that, that's something I talk about from the pulpit here quite frequently is to be an actor, not a reactor. Oh, absolutely. Respond. Don't react. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Love yeah. it. Lots of people have that issue. I, I did for a long time. I still do. You know, I'm, I'm not perfect. Obviously I'm a human being. I don't think there's. 
if you find somebody that's perfect, let me know. Well, but I, if uh, if you meet <laughs> find the if you meet the Buddha on the road on the way to meet him, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> don't don't trust that perfect person. They're lying to you. That oh, is yeah. not the Buddha. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I I tell people all the time. I'm like, beware of people and programs that say they have all the answers. Yeah, for real. And that sort of reactivity and that having all the answers led to the violent reaction of my congregation of good people, people I'd loved people who are trying their best to love and follow Jesus. Right. Heard, man, we had a nine month plan. We planned out there's, there are two uh, full-time pastors at this church, Mm. uh, me and uh, Jim. Jim's been here 26 years. I've been here four, and we made a plan that we were very proud of. Nine months of Bible study and prayer and discussion and guest speakers and book readings and debates, like formal debates. Everyone would get a chance to speak. Anyone who could be respectful would be heard. Right. Nine months of this. It didn't make it. We voted less than nine weeks later. The first group we talked to when we went to our deacons, they serve as the membership committee here. Right. Um, they help make decisions about people joining. And we went and we said, here is the conversation we'd like to have. And from that meeting, some people walked down the hall to their more conservative Sunday school classes and said, the pastors are throwing out the Bible and bringing in the gays. And that Sunday, people left. There was an attempted coup. Uh, that sought to have me fired and the uh, senior pastor who had been here longer, who they had more compassion on, he must have been led astray by this liberal that we've hired. We'll reform him and punish him, but we'll fire Jeremy and get back on course. The coup attempt failed and they left. A third of the congregation walked. Hmm. A third. When we voted... Because we're, we're Baptist, we vote. When yep. we voted on whether or not to actually do this, the vote was unanimous because anyone who had voted against it simply left. No debate, no conversation, no prayer, no study. Right. Nothing. Gone. A third of our people, a third of our staff, and half of our budget. Uh, it's terrible, man. Gone. It's terrible. It's terrifying. Um. I mean, it's it, and it's not only terrifying, but like I said, it's terrible. I mean, that they just would, they 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 couldn't even give the space to just hear you out. Yeah, you know? like to just be like, okay, at least listen to what we have to say. They're like, nope. Yeah. First, first, first chapter introductory. Nope. Yeah, exactly. Just like me. <laughs> and that, <laughs> I've had to be compassionate with them right. because how dare I slam the door behind Absolutely. me? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that that has been hard uh, to oh, not sure. want to condemn those who have condemned me. But Jesus has some things to say about that. So I do my best yep. to listen. But <laughs> m- there were a few conversations, you know, like maybe of a third of the congregation that left, maybe 10 people spoke to me right? in like any meaningful sense. A few people came to confront me. I got called a demon in a grocery store, um, a group of the one that probably hurt the most, man, let me tell you this. You're going to, you're going to recognize this so clearly Excuse me. a group of young families who I was deeply invested in mm-hmm. came and sat on my sofa. You can see the edge of it. Yep. Came here to my office and sat in here about eight adults piled into my little office. Mm. And they said, pastor, we think what you're doing is right, but we have to leave because we can't be viewed as liberal. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> no, see, that's so crazy to me. Just that whole idea of like, I'm just, a, I can't even imagine caring that much what anybody thought of me. Right. You know, and it, a lot of it was <laughs> some people left because what would their parents think if they went to quote the gay church? <laughs> <sighs> oh God. They never hear the end of it. Right. They, they, and they probably that. wouldn't. And see, exactly. And, and that brings up an interesting point. And it's exactly what I was talking about earlier. What would their parents think? What would my grandparents think? So you have mm-hmm. this old guard that is so set in their ways and so entrenched in their ideology that they won't even hear you out. Yeah. And then you have this new generation 
who absolutely is on board with you. And they're like, no, I agree. But because of this old guard that's still there, still lingering, and the, the fear of rejection and the fear of shame and the fear of ostracization, they're... Their their hands are kind of tied, you know. It's almost, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's it's so sad. It's so sad mm-hmm. to, for for them to be like, no, no. We we agree. We absolutely agree, and we think everybody should be included. But we can't stay because if we stay, then we will be subject to ridicule. Yeah. But as as a pastor, one of my proudest moments is, gosh, I think Gen Z might save us. Um. <laughs> Let's hope so. If if the millennials don't ruin everything, Gen Z might save us. Um, a she at the time must have been 16, 15 or 16 year old girl stood up in a Southern Baptist church and told the old guard articulately and compassionately and biblically that they were wrong. Oh well, wow. I bet that was powerful. Oh, I'm I'm like holding back the tears. Oh man, don't hold them it. back, man. I'll cry with you. <laughs> that's yeah, yeah, that's amazing. That's the awesome. courage that's so and the tools. Yeah. She knew what to do with her faith. She knew what to do with her Bible. Right. And it was justice. Right. Yeah. Ah, that's what it's about. That's how it works. That's what's going to save us. That's that's the kingdom being manifest in our reality. Right. That's you know, the kingdom here and not yet. Have you ever heard of the, like the four rules for speech? It's like if it's not kindly, if it's not truthful, if it's not um, timely, helpful. yeah, timely or helpful, then don't say it. And it sounds mm-hmm. like she she hit on all four of those. It sounded yeah. timely. It sounded helpful. It sounded kind, and it sounded useful. Yeah. In that in that meeting, something that's really stuck with me from that night, other than that incredible moment, mm. was uh, that. One of the big questions that kept coming up and continues to come up, it's it's important to remember where I physically am. This is a North Georgia church. Right. We are, if you, if you fly to Atlanta and you drive north, the very last moment where you could think you were in greater metro <laughs> is Kennesaw. We are yeah. the far, northernmost suburb. Go any farther north, you are in Appalachia. Yeah, you get into the Blue Ridge territory we were talking yeah, about exactly. earlier. Yeah. So that we're still there. That's the, that's where the we are. Country up there. <laughs> and some people are who th- even who think it's right, who have mm-hmm. stayed, are uncomfortable. And a question that has come up a lot and that came up in that meeting was why do why can't we do it and not talk about it? Kind of the opposite of let's not and say we did. Let's let's do and not say. Right. But the no, the rejection, the the no has been so loud and so clear and so emphatic and ubiquitous. Mm. Like it's understood. Everyone knows the answer is no. Am I welcome at that church? No. Everyone knows. They don't even have to ask. Right. So we have to say yes. And we have to say it loud and clear and lovingly and humbly in a place of repentance, because that's going to be our repentance. Yeah. That if your church does this, it will hurt. And that's part of the repentance. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, that's a lot, man. That's a lot to unpack. There's there's a lot there. There is a lot there. Man, I, I'm I'm so grateful for this conversation with you. You know, this it's and I think a lot of people will be, it's so refreshing to hear because there is, you know, like I said, especially with the Protestant religion, you know, and it's so deep. It's so, so deep, it's so deeply entrenched within that, you know, just that, that hate mm-hmm. for, for anything that's different. You know, if you're not a white Protestant, <laughs> yeah, if, then if you're not exactly like us, then we don't like you. Yes, yeah. there's there's I, a historic piece to that. Do we have time? Yeah, absolutely. We've got plenty of time. So you look at, I mentioned there's three in the New Testament, and there's a historic piece to where I can point to the moment when this happened. Oh, wow. Okay. Because there's 
the word homosexual mm -hmm. never occurred in the Bible until 1946. It's you talk about editing and translations. It's that new. That's yeah, pretty new. You look at first. So it, it only occurs twice. If your Bible is responsible at all. Um, some Bibles have added it in other places where they think it belongs, which is horrifying. <laughs> I don't think that's okay. There's something it's, inherently wrong about that. It is. <laughs> that is. That is unacceptable. Like um, you, you wouldn't take Shakespeare and add a new character to Othello. You know, <laughs> or make Othello say something new, right? The, yeah. So Paul and not Paul, Paul probably writes first Corinthians. One of Paul's students, we call them pseudo Paul mm -hmm. or uh, yeah, something like that probably writes first Timothy. So both of them contain vice lists, traditional Greek way of writing. If you want to help someone understand how to live, you give them a virtue list and a vice list, things to do, things to avoid in the vice lists of people who will not inherit the kingdom of God in both of these, they read almost identical. So I won't try to separate them too much. Mm. We in English in multiple translations that you could go pick up today, including the most popular, like the NIV, mm. it lists homosexuals in those two lists. Some of them have even gone further to accommodate that cultural expectation and have added the, the phrase practicing homosexuals like that's just so crazy anyway that decision comes out of yale in 1946 in the 1940s a group of scholars at yale sat down to produce an academic translation of the bible mm. the church particularly in the south was frightened by that translation it was coming out of yale and even though that's got a religious history and it's coming out of the div school and the religion department, I mean, that's still a liberal school. So what were these liberal scholars going to do with this liberal translation written for other liberals? And they got to first Corinthians and first Timothy, and they translated the word arsenokatai to homosexual. No one had ever done that before. The reason no one had ever done that before is we have no idea what that word means. I was about, that's Paul exactly what I was up. thinking. <laughs> yeah. Arsenokatai was coined by Paul. And it here's another fancy word for you. In biblical studies, we would call it a hapax legomena. It means a word that only occurs once. You can't compare it to anything else for context. So arsenokatai occurs in two vice lists written by Paul or one of his students with no commentary on what it means. Right. And it doesn't occur other places in Greek other than, I think there's a few people that ask, what does this word mean? <laughs> and so we've always, it's like the King uh, James. Yeah. <laughs> the King James, not a great translation. You point out that it's been, uh, that the King had it read certain ways to help his kingship. Right. Like the, uh, been the in the, the Old Testament, when the Israelites beg God for a king, God says, here are the things the king will do to you. The King James says, here are the rights that a king has over you. Um, ah, things like that. Anyway, King James translates that word pretty well. It says abusers of themselves with mankind. They don't know exactly what's going on, but it's in a list of violent acts like murder uh, patricide, killing your parents, theft, uh, slavery, sex trafficking, prostitution, and two men getting married and having kids. It, it doesn't fit in the list first off, <laughs> but it, the word there is a combination of bed and the word for men and arsenokatai. So he smashes the words together and makes a new word. And so it has something to do with violence and men and maybe beds in i think it's first corinthians i don't have my notes in front of me it also adds the word malakois in front of it mm. which um is a word that means expensive fancy or soft like you would say if you have a nice shirt it would be uh, malakois that's how it's used in other places in the new testament uh when jesus in Ma mark chapter 10 is confronted by a rich young ruler. We're told that his clothes are fancy 
or Malakois. So those words get pushed together into effeminate and homosexual. We see that in first Corinthians sometimes particularly nasty way to translate it. So, So the folks at Yale in 1946 produced the Revised Standard Bible, popular translation, and it says homosexual there for the first time. And they send it to the publisher, and they send proofs to seminaries and div schools and religion departments all around the country. Right. And they get letters, people asking questions. Why have you done this? Can you, can you show your work? Can you explain why you translate it to Arsenokotai? The homosexual and their answer was they think that paul is referencing leviticus bad men mishkaveen but they're confronted about it and argued with and they relent they recant they say this is actually wrong we made an error but there was a publishing agreement the revised standard must be left untouched for 10 years so that the publisher could make their money back on the investment for the work and so that's the enough. liberal, yeah, yeah, that's enough. Time the liberal damage. translation isn't that horrifying? Yeah. The liberal translation comes out in 1946 and says homosexual, and some opportunists say, "Oh, we could cite the academic Bible," and they change abusers or pedophiles. Those were the popular ones. Mm -hmm. Abusers or pedophiles. They switch it in the New Living, the Good News, and the NIV to homosexuals and the rest is history 10 years later yale produces the new revised standard version and it says abusers again wow but the damage was done way to drop the ball Yale. right and now <laughs> the word is out there and it's black and white and in a tradition that says the bible says it i believe it that settles it when you read it in english black and white ink on paper clear as day that's the end of the debate right yeah. You, you know, and the issue with that is just like the issue with any part of the Bible for somebody who's not devout in the Christian faith. And it's that every version of the Bible was written by man. Like, you know, it's interpreted as the word of God, but let's, you know, let's be realistic. It was God didn't sit down at the typewriter one day and be like, I'm going to write a, a scorcher. You know, <laughs> like it, just, <laughs> it didn't, it just didn't happen that way, you know? So we have all these. We have all these messages from all these prophets, but the, it's there supposed is, to be the interpretation of God. But yeah, there was language that only recently softened in some of the conservative traditions in the tradition that this church mm -hmm. was until we were kicked out. The Southern Baptists had it in their doctrine, the things you must believe that the Bible was. Let's see if I can get the language right. Liter was is the Bible is to be interpreted literally, and it was received, it was inspired through direct verbal dictation. God spoke the Bible to the people that wrote it mm. or entranced them to write it. Right. There's the only two ways you got Bible. Yeah. That's that's not even what the Bible says is happening. <laughs> A lot of the Bible doesn't know it's the Bible until it became the Bible. Right. And that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good, that's a good place that's to start. Better. Yeah, that's that's the best place to start from. Like my I faith. Like I don't know what I'm writing. I'm just writing this down. I had the urge. Yep. Yeah. Four continents yeah. sit in in the the Protestant canon. Sixty six books. You can find Christians with up to seventy three. Sixty six books. Three languages. Several thousand years. Four continents. Dozens of writers. And it's relatively coherent right <laughs> that's that's yeah. more miraculous to me than divine dictation yeah well, and it lets me see development the bible doesn't agree with itself all the way through because it is developing it is like i said in conversation with itself hmm. and the the writers of the bible don't think about the world the same way that we do right they don't like they don't think about history or facts the way we do they're not modern writers they're not scientists and they're not journalists right there's there are places where the bible does things that we would couldn't get away with oh, as, yeah absolutely like you you mentioned you write if you wrote 
the the way that the Bible does in some places, you you wouldn't get that published. If I <laughs> no. when I took no Greek, not in today's climate. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, they think my about Greek that. professor grades Paul's Greek as an F. <laughs> right. I mean, think of it just, just about that. Like if you were to if the Bible was to be written now, they would never get published. Not in a million years. It would never they'd be like, nope, we're gonna need some heavy revisions on this one. Mm-hmm. And I'm, it did get but, some heavy revisions. Already, and that's the thing. Yeah, there's already been such heavy revisions. It, it's just so crazy to me. But the revisions make it better. Like, my faith is not weakened by seeing these things. That's the story of my deconstruction and reconstruction, right. is that it's better this way. Yeah. It works this way. And I can, I believe that the Holy Spirit was involved in the process. That when people wrote down their experiences, of what was going on in the world when mm. they wrote down their encounters with what they understood to be the divine, that God was involved in that, that when the editors sat down to make Genesis, because it was a bunch of different oral traditions and writings. And right. you can tell that chapter that sentences next to each other are, it's like if you went from Beowulf to uh, the New York times from yesterday <laughs> and then to, um, um othello right. like you can tell this was not written by one person but it's that's okay the story is still there and i believe the holy spirit was a part of the process right. and you like jenna if you pick up the bible and you start it and you read left to right um you open to genesis one genesis chapter one is newer than genesis chapter two linguistic wise and philosophy and theology wise. And there's two versions of the creation narrative, Genesis one and Genesis two tell the same story twice, different right. ways that you can't, they don't layer perfectly because they're trying to do different things. Genesis two is a- answering the question. How did this come? How did humans come to live in this world like this? It's answering big mythic questions like why is there suffering what what what's uh labor and childbirth about what what is the role of humans in the world it's answering questions like that genesis chapter one is is one it's poetry it's like straight up poetry Mm. you can even see it in english i don't know how people some people get offended when i say that it's literally it's in parallelism it rhymes right but it's it's like it's resistance literature. We're pretty sure that it comes out of Babylon, that the people utterly defeated living in exile under a foreign power that worship the sun and the moon and the stars Mm. like Babylon did and the waters. And they wrote a poem about their God being the source being defeated and living in a foreign power. They wrote a poem a recitable poem that they could remember that said your gods, Babylon, they serve our God. You may think you're winning right now, but our God did all of this. Right. It's resistance poetry. It's (laughs) hip hop. That's so much better than having to believe that the world was created literally in six days. Right. Yeah. That's better. Yeah. That's so much better. It's so much better. (laughs) How about that new Coke Zero, huh? This stuff's good. Hey, <laughs> I don't know. A little bit of an aftertaste. You think so? I, I think yep, they, I'm not sold. I want my black I, cam back. Oh man, I don't know. I don't know. I think they got it pretty close with this one. I'm not. I'm. A, I'm a black cam guy, but this one, this new one's pretty good. <laughs> yep, my church stocks coffee and Coke Zero. Nice, nice. That's a good two good things to have stocked. Need the coffee for the the AA meetings, right? Yep. <laughs> Oh man. Yeah. That's just crazy to me. Yeah. Just the way, the, the way that the, the original text, which even the original text, you know, is left to question, you know, with, with, with what you're saying now, it's like, this isn't necessarily a creation story. This is a resistance piece. This is, yeah. this is screw you Babylon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, that is very likely what we're looking at. 
And since you, you said the word originals, it's worth mentioning we don't have any of them. Right. Yeah, exactly. There are no originals anywhere. Right. I'm sure that, yeah, that, that was, that was or, like you said, it was oral tradition, just like everything else at that point. Well, you know, was it even written down? Like who wrote that down? You know, yeah, not I for think, a long time. Yeah, exactly. It, and was, it would be yeah. dangerous to. Yeah. No, yeah, you would. It's resistance poetry. You don't write that down. Yeah, you would not while you're living as the resistance. Yeah, for sure. You'd put yourself in an extremely awkward position by doing so. Yeah. Yeah. When you get home, you get everyone together and you all recite it. And the best version of it, you write it down. Yeah. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. Religion's so, so weird. That's religion is just so mind blowing to me in the first place that there's just been so much. Because if you if you look at religion across the board, and not just Christianity, but if you look at you know as we discussed Buddhism, which I you know it, it is a religion, but I, it's a non theistic religion, mm-hmm. it's more a, a philosophical religion. Um, Hinduism, uh, Jainism, Taoism, um, Judaism, yeah, just across the board, they're all about love. All religions preach love. I haven't found a single religion that if you get into the basic text of the religion preaches any kind of hatred. And it's so strange that so many wars and so many casualties, and there's still so many casualties from religion. When, when we get right down to it, we're all in agreement. <laughs> you know, like this, now we can go about it in different ways and try to explain it in different ways. But the primary thing is, is, is love. And it, that, yeah. that it gets so lost. It gets so. If we lost. could live by that base ethic, like if we could come to that baseline, right? Yeah. If we maybe could, we could actually have a, a fruitful conversation between religions. Interfaith dialogue is hard. It, oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, we're doing it right now. This is interfaith dialogue. I think it's gone pretty well. I think it's gone great. So, uh, do you have a, a social media presence? Are you are you out in the world? Do you? I mean, I'm clearly... unfortunately all over the internet. Amazing, fantastic. Where can people find you? At? So that all of my all of my socials are linked to. I've got a hub website. So if you go to R E V Rev Reverend Rev Jeremy Hall dot com, mm-hmm. you can get to the LinkedIn. You can get to the Facebook. You can get to the Twitter. I think you can get to the Instagram. I'm I'm going for five thousand on TikTok right now. I'm stuck at the four thousand eight hundreds. Mm-hmm. So, come help me, people. Uh, Pastor Jeremy Kennesaw, nice uh, is where that one's at. But also that Rev Jeremy Hall site will take you to my podcasts. Um, I host the Kingdom Ethics podcast where we talk about how to do ethics. That's my academic version of my field. Mm. Um, how you do it, how you make moral decisions, and sp- we try to apply Christian ethics to current events. But it used to be the only thing we talk about, but now every event needs ethical <laughs> examination. And my co-host for the sake of bragging is like the preeminent Christian ethical voice in the world at the moment. Oh, wow. Uh, Dr. David P. Gushy, um, a professor at Mercer university and the free Baptist university of Amsterdam. Uh, recently the president of the Society of Christian Ethics and the president of the American Academy of Religion. So at pretty least good, he knows where he's going. Pretty good I know, credentials, right? I've got to say. I, I'm really glad to ride those coattails. Oh, I, I um, can imagine. I would be too. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That's super. Uh, there's another podcast I do that examines the values of technology and asks uh, how they dance with the values of the church. That one's called Virtually Church. And uh, that same RevJeremyHall.com website will connect you to my church, Townview, townview.org, if you're interested in checking us out. Um, and a lot of my sermons, a lot of my teachings, a lot of my classes, and uh, speaking and writing is available on that site as well. Nice. Excellent, man. That's great. Well, man, it has been super awesome like talking to you and getting, like, I feel like I've gotten to know you a little bit. And for somebody who's focused on ethics, I, I, I think you're, you're the right person to, to be bringing that message, man, because just to hear how, your story and where you where you started at in your mind state as far as Christianity is concerned and to be in that to one extreme and and I'm not going to say you're the other extreme but you, it seems like man you you've had a lot of personal growth and 
And uh, man, I respect that. I respect that. And the fact that you recognize that and you, and you can admit you're like, yes, no, I did this in the past. I, I thought this way mm-hmm. and I no longer do. Jesus right. has dragged me a long way. Yeah. Seems like he's dragging in the right direction. I hope so. It, it seems, seems like I'm being dragged, kicking and screaming into the kingdom. <laughs> hey, whatever it takes, right? Yep. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll hit you up next time in Pensacola. Let me buy you a beer. I don't drink, but. Okay, well, I'll buy you a Coke Coke Zero. That sounds great. I'll I'll take that. (laughs) Thanks again to Reverend Jeremy Sean Hall for being on the show. If you would like to get in touch with him or are interested in any of his podcasts or the work he's doing, he can be found at RevJeremyHall.com. That's R-E-V JeremyHall.com. I'm working really hard to get some pretty cool guests on the show. Hopefully things pan out. We're just going to have to wait and see and let the outcome be the outcome. Thank you all so much for listening. This has been Dharma Junkie. Namaste. Chaos is beautiful.